Hello. Thanks for taking the time to listen today. My name is Mei-Ling Kopecki. I am a half-white, half-Chinese woman in her late 20s with long brown hair and glasses wearing a warm cream, cream, warm cream sweater. Hi, my name is Drew Maud Griffin. I am a white person in my 20s and my short brown hair is pulled back in a floral scarf and I'm wearing a colorful warm fuzzy sweater. All right, welcome Drew. Thanks for being here. Mm-hmm. So today we are going to discuss the article Becoming Disabled by Rosemary Garland Thompson. This article was written in 2016 and we're just going to go over our initial thoughts of the article. I found this article to be very validating, especially as a person with an invisible disability. I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis when I was 15 years old, and because I was so young, I had a difficult time talking about it and faced a lot of skepticism when I tried to ask for accommodations. And when I read the definition of uh, disability in this article, which is um, from the Americans with Disabilities Act that says disability is a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities, I realized just how broad the definition is. Um, It would seem that a lot of people, when they hear the word disability, only think of visual disabilities like someone in a wheelchair or someone missing a limb, but in reality there are a lot more conditions that fall under the umbrella of disability. Okay. Yeah, I also found it really validating as a person with invisible disabilities and I don't know, I found like it was very timely even though it was written in 2016. I I felt like it could have been published today because Um, the way she talks about kind of areas of growth in the disability community and also, I don't know, the the whole coming out as a disabled person, I found really um, impactful to have words surrounding that um, because I felt like that was a big part of my experience at MCAT and, you know, growing into my 20s because I was, I had multiple learning disabilities growing up, but I wasn't diagnosed with my invisible illnesses until about, I'd say like 20. Um, And that was when I transferred to MCAD. Yeah, it's just uh, disability is a lot more common than people think it is. Um, As was mentioned in the article, disabilities, uh, people with disabilities are the largest minority group in the United States. And actually at MCAD, among the undergraduate population, over 20% of students have a documented disability. So that's like one in every five students, which is pretty substantial. Yeah. And I I felt like the way um, she also mentioned in the article, like talking about how once you start noticing disability, you notice it everywhere. Um, And like, And once you understand it as something really broad, um, such as the definition listed in the article, it becomes, you become aware that there's disabled people all around you and there always has been. Um, And so I think likely for instructors, it might be feeling like there's more and more conversation around disabled students or you didn't have to used to, you know, do this sort of stuff, but the disabled students have always been there and, and disabled students um, and disabled folks in general, you know, have learned how to make do and make places accessible using through all using all different sorts of methods, whether supported by institutions or not. And so as there's this growing shift at MCAD with students becoming more transparent or becoming a larger conversation, um, it doesn't mean that there's, you know, suddenly so many more disabled people it just means that we're thinking more critically about how do we make these a wider institutional level point of access. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because you know we have the right to an education, we have the right to exist, um, and this makes me think of difficulties I faced in the past with getting accommodations. Um, I remember one instructor I had was they. They didn't refuse to give me accommodations, but they were very kind of bitter about it. Um, 
at one point they asked me like, are you sure you can't do, do this assignment? And I was like, well, the assignment requires like me to physically use my strength and my arms. And I'm currently having an MS flare up where I cannot do that. And I, you know, I think that because they couldn't see it, um, they were just not willing <laughs> as much to accommodate. Um, so yeah, there have been instances like this in the past where I feel like if there was more understanding around disability and just how common it is, if there was more awareness, maybe we wouldn't have such trouble getting accommodations. Yeah. And I, I think too, what's, what's critical in this article is she talks about kind of before she recognized herself as disabled and recognized that there was a community of people. Um, and for me, like as an undergrad student at MCAD, I have been advocating for myself for years and years in, on, in terms of, um, you know, with my learning disabilities, I have dyslexia and, um, I, my dad has dyslexia and my mom and him always encouraged me throughout my educational career, career even in like elementary school on how to ad advocate. So I had a skill set going in to be able to be comfortable for doing that. And even so with 20 plus years, 20 plus years of doing that, there's an awkwardness in asking and revealing that you need these accommodations in the middle of a class. So I, I, have a similar experience where it was like I needed help setting up my easels and lifting things like that and putting them away. And there was some times where my professor would be able to do this and just kind of did it without questions. But most of the time I would have to explicitly ask and it would become this like kind of uncomfortable and shameful thing for me. Um, and there was another time where, you know, even though this, these are things that are talked about in my accommodations. Um, and I had personally talked to the professor, which I know many students are not able to do just because it is such a labor to go to a professor and say, Hey, here's why I need all of these things. That's an extra amount of time throughout an, like an already busy schedule. Um, but we, we were visiting, um, the Mia and the class was going up the stairs and I knew I wasn't going to be able to go up the stairs and so I literally yelled to the professor, where are we going? Because I'm not, I can't go up the stairs. Um, and that was like a humiliating moment for me, even though I'm somebody who is generally comfortable with being transparent about my disabilities. I think it takes a lot of unlearning. Um, and I think too, that unlearning is happening on both sides. So for the instructor, but also very much for, for students, especially students who have no experience talking about their own abilities in this way, who are coming from large high schools where this isn't a conversation and who are getting to college and realizing, oh, there's a learning center. Oh, I can ask for these things. Um, I think that's when a lot of students recognize their need for accommodations. So a lot of people aren't comfortable. And so it, there's a discomfort on both sides that needs to be dissolved. Yeah, for sure. And this also brings up the importance of universal design for learning guidelines. Um, as someone who will be working in higher education after I graduate with my MFA, um, this is something I've thought about a lot when designing curriculum is that, you know, as you mentioned, having to ask for accommodations in the middle of class or kind of being the one person that sticks out from the rest is rather frightening or anxiety inducing at times it makes me think of an example where for if a professor doesn't allow laptops in the mm -hmm. class and you need to take notes or something like that it's just suddenly people are going to ask questions and not all students are going to be comfortable with answering those questions and you know um for the story that i mentioned earlier with the instructor who didn't want to or did they did eventually but was very hesitant about giving me accommodations um it was so kind of embarrassed I don't know if embarrassing is the right word but I felt a lot of shame in my disability and it made me you know not even want to go to class I didn't want to have to interact with this professor because it was so emotionally draining for me to have to constantly ask for these accommodations that I needed so it's important to 
really think about to designing a classroom that fits the most people rather than trying to make people change in order to fit the learning environment. Yeah, totally. And I think, yeah, I've had professors at MCAD who were really, really brilliant at doing this. And, um, you know, I was kind of amazed, like I went into class and usually I would have, especially my first two years at MCAD, I would talk to every professor after the first class. And I very explicitly would say, here are all my needs. Here is the accommodations I need, because I knew that folks were getting many, many of these emails with all of these accommodations listed. And I knew that um, there was a high probability of of them not really knowing where I was there on that list of folks. And also like, putting a face to the, to the needs. Um, but one professor, she was like, basically like, okay, so every video in this class needs to have captioning. So if you have a a video that you're showing, please put subtitles in if you're able to. And like, we're going to have a lot of work time in this room. I know the lights are very harsh. If you have a problem with the lighting, let me know. Um, and we can just turn down the lights or do something else. Um, and was like, she just kind of went over through like a long list of access needs um, at the beginning of class before anybody had introduced themselves. And I felt like just that kind of introduction and that research ahead of time to know these are potential issues that could come up made that class environment one where there was automatically less shame, where there was automatically less embarrassment in the event that I did need to say, hey, I need this accommodation right now and I have to say it out loud in front of everybody. Having a professor who is the leader of that room put, put in that attention and that and that extra little bit of work um, really changed the environment and the whole course for me. Yeah, that sounds just, that. honestly, that sounds like it would be super helpful. I'm imagining being in that situation. Um, I'm also pretty comfortable with talking about my disability. I have been for a while as well, also with advocating through my artwork and whatnot. But when the accommodations are already there, that just saves so much mental energy. <laughs> and um, talking more about uh, designing classrooms, I've another thing I've been thinking about is democratic intention in the classroom and how some actions, while are, you know, the instructors mean well, for example, if you know, there's a poll in the class and instructor says, hey, should we do this or this? And there's 20% of the students have a disability and 80% don't. And the 80% vote for something that isn't as accessible for the 20%. Um, While maybe it seems like it's a fair and good idea to do, uh, it's still not creating an accessible environment. Totally, totally. And I, I've had that experience personally in many of my classes. And I think it's, again, it goes in points in favor of this one professor who had, had considered these things. I think it's, um, you know, in learning, I'm a teaching artist myself and in learning about teaching, um, there's like this commitment to like researching your craft and understanding you know, like always wanting to improve. And I think for art instructors that, yes, that means staying up to date with contemporary art and different methods, but it also, it means educating yourself on access and on these different ways of making your classroom more accessible. That is just as important because it can mean the difference of a student engaging in class and not engaging in class and a student actually getting information and not getting information. Like you said, not going to class because there is this like kind of tension and awkwardness around giving you your accommodations, putting that effort in around researching um, disability and accessible teaching and universal design. That is as important as any syllabus um, and specific instructions you write about painting, about sculpting, about anything. Um, And I I wish there was a broader understanding of how important it is, especially at a school like MCAD, where there are so many students who have disabilities. Yeah, that makes me think about um, towards the end of the article, uh, the 
there's a quote that I really like that says, becoming disabled demands learning how to live effectively as a person with disabilities, not just living as a disabled person trying to become non-disabled. It also demands the awareness and cooperation of others who don't experience these challenges. So I just wish that, you know, well, I, I'm, both of us are actively working towards a future where there's more disability awareness, but especially in educational environments, um, it's just so important that instructors know what's going on. Yeah. And I, and I feel like in doing some sort of student advocacy work while I was at MCAD, you know, part of what professors t- talked about is yes, we hear you, but also we need your participation as well. It's a two-way street. And I think understanding that there's this kind of learning to deal with your own disabilities and this acceptance of your disability and that that can be a lifelong journey for folks. I feel like there, there is work happening on both sides. And just to even be having those discussion, a lot of work has already been done. And so I think, yeah, it's like, I mean, for me, looking back on my undergraduate career, I feel like I had, did not accept the fact that I was somebody who has an energy limiting illness. Um, and my goal was to be the best MCAD student that I could be, not considering any of my disabilities. And so there were many times where I worked past my capacity um, and I worked through flares Um And ultimately, I feel like that has damaged my health permanently. I ultimately feel like now as a working adult, I have less energy than I did when I started at MCAD. And that is partly because of my own lack of acceptance, but also the culture that can happen in these really rigorous academic environments. And so something, again, I want to like reiterate and emphasize in this podcast is like, this is really, really important. This can, this can really impact students' opinions on their education, on the knowledge that they have access to, and also just on their general health and mental well-being. Yeah, that I also have definitely worked beyond my capacity um, in the past. For my undergraduate experience, it took me six years uh because and I got my BFA from the University of Minnesota, but it took six years because I was pretty much forced to take classes part time due to my health, and also I was forced to take classes online. And at the time, there weren't many online options for a lot of the classes that I needed totally. to take, so it was very difficult to kind of work around what I like to call my health schedule. For example after 4 p.m. going to class becomes very difficult for me. And so I really had to choose classes that took place during the day or I had to choose classes that only met in person once a week. And um, as the pandemic moves on and we try to start going back in person again, I think that it's important to continue to recognize the importance of both online and high flex options for students because I've been able to go to class when I have a migraine when classes are online, which is something I was never able to do before. I was actually able to sit there in the dark and listen to the lecture, which if it was in person, I would have had to just stay home. It's dangerous for me to drive, you know? Yeah. No. Oh my gosh. That is such an important point. Like I feel that like for me, when we shifted to online learning, so my, for the first like two years of my career at MCAD, I had, my accommodation was to have up to three absences, um, at, in my classes. Um, and sometimes that was like even a stretch, but pretty much every class I took, I used all three absences. I had many days where I painstakingly tried to decipher whether or not I should use my like one absence um, that day, or if I should save it for another day when I'm feeling worse. When we, when we shifted to online learning, I literally did not miss a single class for an entire semester for the first time in my um, college career. And that was 
life-changing for me. I felt more engaged in my classes. I felt more excited to do my work. I felt like there was this whole new world of opportunities for me. And I know that was not every student's experience, but I think it is worthwhile knowing that that is an experience that happened. And having the ability to take online classes going forward could have been huge for me. Most of the classes I needed my last semester at MCAD, none of them were offered online. So I had to go in person and I had to prep myself up and think, okay, am I going to risk my life for getting my BFA? I guess I am. <laughs> and and it was worth it for me in the end. And I, and I enjoyed it, but I did miss classes. And I wish that my last semester at MCAD had been like, those that first online semester where I didn't miss a single class mm -hmm. because that was just it meant so much to me. Yeah, honestly, I in the MFA program, this is my first time being a full time student since before I was diagnosed with MS, which was 2010. <laughs> So it's been quite a while. And I think that the reason I was able to succeed the first year is because it was all online. Yeah. And maybe this is why High Flex moving into the future is going to be such an important um, option because I also recognize there are a lot of students who really benefit from an in-person experience, mm -hmm. but um, for students like you and I, you know, when we don't have to physically move, we do a lot better. Our brains can actually function and we're awake. Yay. Yeah. And I, and I think it's, that's part of disability is acknowledging that there's like it's like, yes, and kind of, because mm -hmm. there, yes, there are students with disabilities who benefit from being in person, but there's also students who benefit from high flex or online learning. And so there's, I don't know, I feel like, which is mentioned in the article, by the way, like how common and how large a category disability is. And so I think, yeah, just keeping that in mind when designing a class, yes, that's going to be difficult to try and have all these different access things. But I feel like knowing how many students, like one in five at at least, will benefit from it in your classes, I, I hope that's a motivating factor for this extra work. And I hope that MCAD as an administration um, supports that kind of extra labor and extra research um, that needs to happen, especially mm -hmm. in a time where we're going through this global pandemic. Yeah. I mean, it is, we are fighting for radical inclusion at MCAD. So yes. <laughs> unless there's awareness about what that means, it's not going to happen. Um, I also thought, I like this phrase in the article, um, as we manage our bodies in environments that are not built for them. So social barriers can sometimes be more awkward than the physical ones. And the social barriers are only awkward because of the lack of awareness. Yeah, totally just yeah again it kind of goes into when when you are a professor and and you're leading a classroom you are kind of dictating the environment that that classroom is going to be students are as well but when you are leading by example that can make a shift in the terms of what the class looks like and what what discussions happen there um and so yeah it's a huge responsibility but also you know, folks with disabilities are carrying that responsibility all the time and sometimes is extremely negatively impacting us. Mm -hmm. um, so just sharing the weight of that responsibility with an instructor, I feel like is that's radical access. I feel like, um, you know, in the article, she talks about how there was this woman who had a son with or a, a, a child with um, dwarfism and um yeah. Because she loves him and because he is in her life, she has been made aware about so much about disability. And I feel like MCAD can structure the same way because we care about each other and because we're in community with each other. We can learn about disability and we can create that space. Um, because I know that there are many professors at MCAD who become mentors to folks at, even at post-graduation. Um, and I feel like making sure disabled folks are part of that mentorship is, is huge. Mm -hmm. 
So Drew, if you could list kind of a top five things that instructors could do that would be helpful for students, particularly students with disabilities, what would those be? I would say the first thing would be building a foundation of trust for all your students. I think that sometimes when there are absences or late work, it's easy to assume it's because the student doesn't care or it's because of X, Y, and Z and not because of anything related to disability. Um, I think just having a level of trust with students who are, are adults at this point, when they come to you and say, hey, I need to step out of class for X, Y, and Z, or I need a break, just having the trust built in to say, yeah, okay, go ahead, come back by this time, or does this time work for you? Or here's what we did in class today. Um, please research this on your own and not like docking a whole grade. Um, I think building trust that students are telling the truth about their experiences or have a valid reason for the way that they need to learn things um, will create a more comfortable and honest environment for all students. Um, and students will be more upfront about what's going on if they feel like they can trust the teacher and the teacher will believe in them. And speaking about making everyone comfortable in the environment, I think that a second thing that instructors could do is really try their best to follow universal design for learning guidelines, because if the environment is accessible to everyone, then there's even less of a need to have students accommodate to succeed. Definitely. Um, and I think kind of built into MCAT already is, you know, the structure of having accommodation letters for students who do have documented disabilities. And I have had teachers <laughs> tell me like, oh, you know, I get so many of these. I just, I don't have time to read them. I would say a really important thing is to read them and to then, say, or even just seeing the name on the accommodations list and emailing the student and saying, hey, I got your accommodation letter. Um, let me know if you'd like to meet about this in office hours or after class or exchange emails because it helps me remember, you know, it, it helps me put a person to, to the name on the paper. Um, because sometimes those conversations just won't happen unless a professor is the one to make that point of contact. Um, very few students are comfortable saying, okay, here's my accommodation and here um, is why I need them or here. Um, like I'm the person who needs these, that's kind of an awkward position to put the student in. And so inviting a student into having that conversation can be really essential to developing a dialogue with that student and um, just in general understanding where they're coming from in terms of their accommodations and why you need to really respect them and use them. Yeah, you know, and that reminds me of another thing that I think would have definitely been important for me in undergrad is just if instructors really understood the importance of online and high flex options, especially moving forward now that we've been doing it for a little while. I found that for me, online options are just the most accessible. Like just the other day for critique, when I had a terrible migraine, I was able to participate from the comfort of my home, um, even though I was in a lot of pain and I was leaving my comments in the chat because I still wanted to participate, but there's no way I would have been able to go to campus. Definitely. I've, I've been in similar situations so many times. And, and too, with that like online learning aspect, when we were using remote learning, um, something I really appreciated too and was a signal of trust to me for my professors is them letting me have my camera off. They trusted mm -hmm. the fact that I was there and I was listening. Um, and I just didn't want people to see me like laying sick in bed at this yeah. terrible angle. They, they just said, and if you need your camera off, that's totally fine. Um, and that was a huge comfort and a huge, um, bonus point for me. And it made me feel like I could reach out to those professors Mm -hmm. There's actually a New York Times article called When the World Shut Down, They Saw It Open. And it's pretty much these first person stories from people with disabilities who suddenly when the pandemic hit, now they were able to be a part of something. They were able to attend events just because of the fact that they were virtual and kind of how moving forward into the future, 
um, we're just worried that we'll lose those options. So once again, it's called When the World Shut Down. They saw it open. Definitely check it out if you haven't yet. Another resource too, and this is something that I've talked to faculty at MCAT about previously, but um, Sins Invalid is a really excellent disability group that does a lot of arts programming. Um, and they have a disability justice primer available online um, as a PDF. And it's you can either download it for free or you can make a small donation to their group. But it really has a wide um, coverage of really essential things to know about disability. And the name of that um, book is Skin, Tooth, and Bone, Disability Justice Primer. So to summarize these top five things, number one, believe students' experiences and trust them when they're telling you what they're going through. Number two, follow universal design for learning guidelines. Number three, read accommodation letters and reach out to those students. Number four, really try to understand the importance of online and high flex options moving forward. I know that for a lot of people, that's it's difficult as um and someone who's been a TA, I know that there are a lot of struggles, but really these options, especially moving into the future, will remain to be important. And then number five is learn more about disabilities. Um, check out Sins Invalid, like Drew said, and just awareness is key. Yeah, and, and I think, too, understanding that disability is understanding disability is an essential part of being a professor or a teacher or a mentor or even just a member of society right now. Um, so consider it as part of you learning and researching the new components of your craft, whether that's painting or drawing or sculpting. This is just as integral to your practice. All right. Thanks, everyone, for listening. This is Mei Ling, MFA 22. And this is Drew, BFA 21. Thank you. Thanks.